All righty. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our monthly live uh, Real Mushrooms Pet Q&A. Uh, my name is Joni Camlet, and I'm here with Dr. Rob Silver, who is our wonderful uh, veterinarian and formulator of the Real Mushrooms products. Hey, Rob. It's good hey, to Joni. <laughs> great to be here. Mm -hmm. It's great. Yeah, it's great to be here with you. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're 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 kind of getting in the groove here, uh, doing these uh, doing these QAs Q and As every month. Yeah, this uh, is what number three now, isn't it? This is number three. Yeah, That's starting great. to get a get a little rhythm going. Get a little rhythm going, yeah, and it's always nice to nice to see you and uh, check in. So uh -huh. uh, yeah, so we can. Um, do we have any questions yet? Hmm. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for that reminder. Yeah, uh, if anybody coming on, feel free to enter uh, any of your que uh, pet questions in the chat um, and we will address them. We also have some questions uh, that people have already uh, sent to us. So we're, uh, we can go ahead and start with those as well. Uh, the first one being, uh, do our dogs' bodies become immune to the health uh, benefits of mushrooms? if we use them on a continuous basis? Uh, that's, I get that qu question a lot, Dr. Silver. It's, it's a good question. And actually the dog's bodies and our own bodies mm -hmm. um, don't become immune to the health benefits. The health benefits actually improve the longer that we use them because it does something that is known as training our innate immune system, which is the immune system that we have that, um, that is able to, that recognizes a variety of different pathogens and, and, and uh, invaders and antigens. So by using the mushrooms on a daily basis, and you don't have to use really high doses unless you're addressing something really very serious, but doing them every day really trains our immune system to be more vigilant, to be available when some threat happens. And in fact, by doing it every day, once you've done several months worth, you know, you forget a day or two, you know, you go away for the weekend and you can't get, you can't get the shrooms into your dog. It's not going to matter because your immune system has already been trained and already been improved. So no, I think in fact, I call mushrooms kind of a lifestyle supplement. It's something that really should be part of your daily lifestyle, part of your dog or cat's daily lifestyle as well, because the benefits are much better when it is used regularly like that. Yeah, kind of like an insurance is how I look at it yeah. uh, when taking mushrooms. It's like my my health insurance and and uh, for that for that of my pets as well. And to follow up on this question, uh, one of the uh, which is kind of the same question said a different way. Um, I've had a lot of people asking me about uh, what's called pulsing the mushrooms or rotating the mushrooms. Like, mm -hmm. uh, is there any benefit to, um, and, you know, pulsing, you, you've answered that question about, you know, that the, they yeah, should just be used. Yeah, there's nothing yeah. wrong, for instance, like if you want to do five days on and two days off just to give your body a bit of a rest, yeah. uh, it's not going to affect the level of immunity you've created, right. and, you know, and it, it, it's not necessary, but it is something that might give you or your dog a break just from that daily administration. I take a lot of supplements myself and I get tired of doing them every day, day in, day out. So I generally don't do it over the weekend. I, I use the weekend yeah. as well is my kind of cheat time, you know? A little break. Um, yeah. Then the, then the, the question of, well, what about alternating or rotating right. among different mushrooms? And a lot of it depends on what you want to do. You know, if you're just using the mushrooms for wellness and just for promoting general health and there's nothing wrong with your animal, you don't need to generate more energy, you don't have chronic immune system issues, you don't have mentation or cognitive or anxiety issues, right then, you know, it may not really be that necessary, but it, there would be nothing wrong with doing it. On the other hand, you know, if your um, animal yourself has some conditions that might be more specifically addressed by a specific mushroom, you know, like allergies and reishi or chaga, um, mentation issues like um, lion's mane or cordyceps um, or reishi, um, you know, immune system issues, so on and so forth. Um, 
personally, and, and I think that we, we had a wonderful um, practitioner's roundtable this week with Dr. Barbara Fougere from oh, Australia. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, 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 um, and in that um, um, context, you know, she also agreed that it's, you know, that oftentimes combining mushrooms and taking two at the same time or three at the same time, depending on what your needs are, oftentimes creates a, a, a more potent synergy yes. than just using one alone. Yes. So, you know, it's, I think it's kind of fun because you can sort of mix and match. You can learn more about what mushrooms are good for what things, and you can do some self-care here as well. Mushrooms are very harmless. They've been used as food, many of them for, for millennia with no evidence of harm. I've just yeah. finished writing a new article on the safety of mushrooms, and I went through the literature, and they are very, very safe. You know, safe, yeah. Unless they're poisonous, in which case right. they're not safe. So, um, yeah, so I, so I think that those are, that's a good question. And, and that would be, I think, a good answer. Yeah, no, that's great. And also, um, just to add to that, we have the five defenders formula. So if somebody does want a variety and doesn't want a bunch of different bottles of mushrooms or have to buy a, you know, a new one every time using the five defenders, which what that has the reishi, the chaga, maitake, uh, shiitake and turkey tail in it. So mm -hmm. It's a great, uh, great, great base coverer. The uh, Five Defenders is very popular, and it's a very yeah. good combination formula. And um, I strongly recommend it if you're looking for that kind of combination, you know, pulsed yeah. approach. Um, I've been looking at some of the mushrooms and looking at some of the, the research we have of the critters. I've been thinking about making a Five Defenders type of formula for the ki for the for the dogs. Thinking about maybe calling it four, you know. The, the four paws and and and, <laughs> and, and five defenders or something yeah. like that, and, and using mushrooms that are maybe more specific for conditions that we see in, in the dogs. I'm I'm really enjoying my work here as chief veterinary officer with real mushrooms, yeah. and and it's 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 really stimulating my imagination, my creativity in terms of the products that I'm designing to that we will be you know um, launching over a period of time. We're, we're just rolling them out one at a time as we, you know, as we have them available. Yeah. And, and we are really enjoying uh, you, Dr. Silver, uh, being with Real Mushrooms. So <laughs> it's a win, win. Yeah. yeah. Um, hey, Naja. Um, Naja Muller has a great question um, mm -hmm. uh, my, uh, about mushrooms and uh, parasites. Are there, uh, are there any mushrooms that are beneficial uh, against parasites and mites? And if so, which ones? Well, um, I know that traditionally chaga um, has been used um, to treat parasites. And you know, if you remember Atsi, the Iceman, he carried a couple of, um, of mushrooms in his pouch, one of which, um, which is not one that, that we commonly cultivate. I think it's the Fomatopsis, um, kind of difficult to pronounce, also is good for intestinal parasites. So yes, there are certain mushrooms that could be good. Yeah, you know, it depends what, why you want to use a mushroom to, right. to take care of parasites. As a veterinarian, I'd have to say that we've got some very good non-toxic, you know, um, pharmaceuticals that can really clear away parasites right away. You know, and parasites have a life cycle. So oftentimes you have to treat and then retreat. So, um, and if you're not effective, then you may not know it unless you study the stool to see that they've got parasites. So, so for intestinal parasites, you know, um, I think you certainly are welcome to try mushrooms, but I think you might find better better effect and, and equally low toxicity if you look at some of the, the pharmaceutical wormers we have, like fenbendazole, for instance, which also has some immune system um, benefits. But when you're talking about mites, you know, with 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 mites in animals, um, whether it's sarcoptic or seroptic or demodectic mites, there's always an immune system issue that allows these mites to attack the animal. So using a mushroom that has immune enhancing properties can be very helpful in the long run to help clear the mites out of the system. Mites can be pretty thorny and pretty difficult to get rid of and, 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 and improving immune system may not be enough or, or using an herbal wash may not be enough, you know, with tea tree oil or, you know, things such as that. So again, at the same time, there are some treatments for mites that could be a little more toxic than the treatments I'm describing for um, um, intestinal mites. 
right. many of us in the integrative medicine community believe that the mites find a hospitable host in part due to imbalances in the animal. And so, although we may, it may not be as efficient to treat the mites directly with the mushrooms, using the mushrooms to strengthen your dog and to strengthen its immune system and to, and, and in fact, perhaps even help it with some of the, the um, inciting causes. For instance, we think that food allergies can oftentimes cause a dampness and an excessive amount of oil on the skin. You know, if your dog has food allergies and has skin problems and you smell it, it smells a little funny. Yeah. So by, you know, so by also looking at what you're feeding and maybe doing some testing, either elimination diets or some of the mm -hmm. saliva testing that we have to find out what foods your animal is sensitive to, that could also be a way to work in a multifactorial way to, to remove the, the, to rid yourself of the mites and rid them on a permanent basis because you're making the animal healthier versus just killing the mites. Yeah, create the more inhospitable environment you create uh, through a boosted immune system, the better. And uh, what Naja is saying is that, um, yeah, her puppy has mange and uh, they, they are using the ivermectin, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but her pup's still itchy. Uh, so I'm wondering if reishi might help with that itchiness. Reishi, reishi would be a yeah. very good solution there, both for the immune system and for its anti-inflammatory activity and for its antihistamine activity and the ivermectin you know these like i said these bites are really difficult to get rid of and it, it takes some time and, and you know be patient yeah. it might take a month or two or even three there are some shampoos you might want to look at as well some topicals that could help with the mites but also could help to reduce the itchiness of the skin yeah. without using a strong drug to do that, like a steroid. Now, you might want to consider some low dose antihistamine, but I'd try the reishi first. You know, yeah, in terms in terms of that itching. Um, yeah, a great great answer. I love that. Uh, mm -hmm. I hope that helps, Nasha. And we have a question. Uh, Penny Coyne has a great question. Um, uh, she's interested in how mushrooms can enhance the vaccination process to produce a stronger immune response. Uh, is there a protective ag uh, effect against possible uh, adverse reactions? Great question. Yeah. And in fact, there's a study that was yeah. published in Eastern Europe in shelter dogs that were that were so stressed that their immune system was suppressed. Um, they were unable to achieve any kind of protective immunity from their rabies vaccination. And so what they did was they gave these puppies um, a, a month's preconditioning with the beta-glucan extract of the oyster mushroom, but really any beta-glucan extract of any mushroom would work. It happened to have been an oyster mushroom company that funded that study, so we know it works in oyster mushrooms as well. Um, and they gave it for a month, and then they gave the rabies vaccination, and they all achieved protective titers. So I think it's a very good and legitimate approach, especially if you are a bit, you know, hesitant about vaccinating your pet and want to make sure that there's adequate risk in order, uh, risk in your environment in order to vaccinate against those diseases that you're risky for, or perhaps your, your pet has had some adverse reactions to vaccinations, which is not impossible. Mm -hmm. um, whether the mushroom would protect them from any adverse reactions, I, I don't know. I haven't seen any evidence, any study that really looked at that specifically. In the study that was in Eastern Europe, they didn't describe the adverse reactions either way. Yeah. Um, so, but but speaking from my own experience, um, I take a lot of mushrooms <laughs> and a lot of uh, purified beta-glucans as well, purified from the, from the yeast. And I was, I'm well vaccinated for COVID you know, three, four vaccinations, not one single post-vaccination reaction, period. So, um, you know, that's a case of one, who knows. Yeah. But I, I, think, I think it certainly is a legitimate yeah. way to go. Also, you know, some veterinarians are open to giving a reduced volume of vaccine for animals that are smaller in size because the size of the vaccine has been, it's just standardized regardless of the size of the animal. And so there's thinking that perhaps, you know, a little Maltese that's only 15 pounds doesn't need the same dosage, you know, that a Great Dane who's 150 pounds does. Right. 
So, but at the same time, you want to be able to know you're achieving protective titers, which means that after vaccinating, you may want to draw blood and check to make sure that that reduced volume of vaccine that would also help to reduce adverse reactions was effective. Yeah. Why vaccinate if it's not going to be effective? Exactly. And Patty, I see you're asking for that shelter study. I don't know if we could link it during the live unless uh, Sky, who's behind the curtain, uh, has access to that. But um, I will certainly, I can send it to you like, uh, through Facebook. And then after this recording is over, we can put it in the, we can put it in the chat. So we'll make sure that you get that. Um, Happy to do that. Yeah. And I also just to add to that, I mean, uh, Dr. Silver, what do you think about like uh, using homeopathy as far as uh, managing vaccination reactions? I, I know that um, when I was in hands-on practice, we would often recommend and working at an integrative practice, we would recommend like something like Thuya um, with vaccines. Well, I think that the vaccination, um, using a homeopathic as one part of a program to deal with vaccination reactions makes sense. Yeah. Homeopathy is not really meant to be proactive. You don't really right. give homeopathic remedies as preventatives. You give them when you have symptoms from whatever. So there's several different homeopathic remedies that are used to counter the side effects that we see from vaccinations. Thuya, which is from the cedar tree, is one. Another one is called Listen, which is actually the, the um the saliva of a rabid dog, I believe. Oh my. Yeah. So um it's so strange. So for ladies, you'd probably want to be more likely to use something like that. And perhaps for the other the other vaccinations that uh, rabies is a terrible disease. And, yeah. and and in order to create a vaccine for it, then the vaccine itself has the potential to have some adverse reactions to it. But it's a terrible disease. There's no cure for it. Yeah. Um so um yeah. yeah, perhaps that's a, homeopathy might be a way to do that as well. Preconditioning with mushroom yeah. beta glucans, feeding yeah. a good diet, you know, healthy lifestyle, you know, exactly. healthy emotional environment. Those are all things that can produce a healthy um, non-adverse reaction to a vaccination. And also potentially not getting the five in one or the six in one trying to spread the vaccine doses. When out. I was in practice and I would vaccinate animals. First of all, I would start them later than what the vaccination recommendations are. I'd usually start them at 12 weeks of age unless I had no choice and had to start them earlier. And if there's active infection in the household or in that in the, the local area, I would I would start earlier. Um, and I would only give two booster shots, you know, at 12 weeks and at 16 weeks. And then we um, and then for the distempers, for the distemper ones and the rabies, then we would wait until six months to give, but we would separate those out as much as we could instead of giving the multivalent vaccines. And it seemed to produce a very low rate of vaccination issues, at least in my practice. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Ditto, same. Um, so I hope that answers your, uh, your question, Patty. And we have a question from Kelly Burkett. Um, is turkey tail mushroom safe for dogs and does one need to protect the liver? Uh, can I eat it? Can I heat it to add to food to make it more tasty? Great question. So um, yes, the turkey tail mushroom is safe for dogs, although there are as of yet no published or objective safety studies in dogs. Yes. <laughs> there, I, it's something I'm working on. Um, but there, there is one study in, in rats in which they gave excessively high dosages of turkey tail, uh, 1,250, 2,500, 5,000 milligrams of turkey tail per kilogram of rat weight. They gave it orally, and then they they gave it for they gave one single dosage and observed for toxicity, and then they gave a dosage daily for 28 days and observed no signs of toxicity. Um, they did blood work; nothing was out of the ordinary. Yeah. So there's no reason for you to be concerned about any adverse impact on the liver. In fact, mushrooms are known to be very beneficial for the liver instead, unless they're the toxic mushrooms that are toxic to the liver, you know? So not to worry about that. And, and with turkey tail mushrooms, especially if you're using it to treat serious diseases, you might want to use 
a pretty high dosage. So that's one reason why I want to do the safety study so we could be certain in the dog that we can use those high dosages with impunity. I'm pretty certain that you can because from all the historical evidence that we have. And if you're using the turkey tail mushroom extract from real mushrooms uh, in the powder form, let's say, um, it's already been heated. In order to actually extract the goodies from the mushroom, we have to boil it or heat it, put it in very hot water, nearly boiling for several hours. Yeah. So heating it again, it's very heat resistant. I would not concern myself about that at all. You can just mix it in the food that way. Um, I don't think heating it's going to make it more tasty. I think it's the kind of food you put it in that's going to make it more tasty. Yeah. And uh, to, to add on to that, I mean, the heating, uh, heating the mushrooms, I mean, or cooking them actually releases the medicine. Uh, would you, I mean, I know that's a very simplistic way of putting it, but, um, but as far as, you know, cooking mushrooms as, as opposed to eating them raw, uh, the heating process actually is beneficial, correct? Turkey tail is really not known to be very... Well, which, yeah, I mean, I'm talking mushrooms in general. Definitely, I don't want to eat, <laughs> I don't want to cook well, any turkey tail. I was, I was reading today, I said, I'm working on this turkey tail article, and I was, I was reading today um, how Native Americans would harvest the turkey tail, and they would pound it, and they would boil it, and then they would make it into some kind of a mash that they would eat. And before, when it's a new, when it's a fairly early turkey tail mushroom bracket fungi fungus on the tree yeah. um it's a little bit soft and that's the time really to harvest it if you are interested in ingesting it in that way um, oh, interesting mm -hmm. huh very yeah. cool uh kelly i hope that uh addresses your question um what's next uh do we have some uh can we go to some of the questions that we got before we started uh, it's like magic. It just pops up on the screen. Um, what is the biggest difference between the pet product capsules and the human capsules? Um, are the pet capsules smaller? So um, I'm responsible for creating the entire pet line. And I've got a, a kind of a, a big picture in mind. The first place we wanted to begin was simply to take the existing raw materials that we put into capsules for humans and put them into slightly smaller capsules to accommodate the slightly smaller size of pets and the lesser amount that a pet would need for a general dosage. So the human capsules are 500 milligrams, the pet capsules are 300 milligrams. So it, it works that way. And they're smaller, they're easy to, easier to put into the mouth. Um, and that's, that's, that's what we're doing with the capsules. We're, I'm still in the process of, of, of of invention with the pet powders. And we've been looking at, because we, we don't want them to be the same, we want them to be better than the human powders. And so I've got some ideas, I'm gonna be secret right now with them. I've got some ideas, we're working on them. I'm putting together prototypes and testing them for taste because not only does the product that I design have to be effective, we've got to be able to get it to the critter. And the only way to get it in to the critter, especially if it's a powder you're going to mix in with the food, as um, as Kelly was, you know, concerned about getting the turkey tail powder into her dog's food, because it's a lot easier than to put the mushroom powder in the food than try to, you know, get that capsule yes. in them. Um, so we're I'm working on that as well. And, you know, just taking our time. It's a slow process. I don't want to rush into it. I want to make sure I do it right, and I do it right the first time. So that's the powders. Stay tuned. That's going to happen. And then we've got a couple of soft chews. We've, we've got two soft chews right now, and we're looking at other potential soft chews in the future. We've got one soft chew that is more of a calming, relaxing sort of a blend. Mm -hmm. In addition to the mushrooms that are in it, which would be lion's mane and the reishi, which both have calming properties on our um, our mentation and our, our nervous system. Um, it also has um, um, herbs such as um, um, ashwagandha and um, astragalus and other herbs that are known to be calming herbs. So um, then we have one that is also for immune and in the our immune soft juice have our famous five defenders in it plus herbs that are specific for immune enhancement. So it, it gives it, it gives it kind of a, a higher potency in a very tasty little um, soft chew treat like dosage, dosage form treat, so to speak. So that's the story. Yeah. My, my puppy uh, 
puppy. Well, she's my nine-year-old puppy. Scruffy just loves every time I open the the jar. She's well, and and Kelly, Kelly, <laughs> the, the woman who had asked about you know heating the turkey tail to put in the food. Yeah. We talk about soft shoe. She goes, "Great idea. <laughs> it, will, it will make it a lot easier for you to get it into the into your critter, especially if it has. It, you know, as we know, mushrooms need to be given every day, and if it's a yeah. fight, it ain't going to happen." Yeah, we want, we're trying to make it as easy as possible. And uh, Dr. Silver, I'm very excited about these secret recipes you're working on. And I know that you have some very discerning taste testers in your household. So, uh, and you're a perfectionist about, you want every single dog and cat, uh, which I can't even imagine that, um, to be able to, to readily eat, uh, eat these products. So, you know, I'm realistic it's a about, progress. I'm realistic about cats. Yeah. Well, your dogs anyway. Um, and I do want to add to what you mentioned about the, the pet capsules versus <clears throat> versus the human capsules. Um, it's great that the pet capsules are smaller at 300 milligrams. We also lowered the price of the pet line. So if you go on our website and you look at the human products versus the pet, you'll see the pet products are less expensive. And that's because there's less, uh, there's less uh, milligrams per capsule. So you know, depending on how large your dog is and how many capsules you're giving, it could it could be more cost effective uh, to use the pet uh, the pet line. Uh, so right. just wanted to mention that. Yeah. And Heather comments that my dog loves the taste of the five defenders powders, and you know, and Kelly comments that um, it tastes awful. You know, and so really, it's also very in, in, in individual. I've heard of you know, I've heard of some pet parents that their dog doesn't notice the turkey tail at all. Yeah. Food. So, you know, it's it's very, it's very specific to the dog and 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 yeah. how picky they might be. And you know, kibble, kibble, um, I'm not I'm not fond of kibble. Um and, and I think kibble really creates more picky tastes in, in many dogs because they get used to this very bland cardboard taste and you give them something that might have real food in it and have some real flavor to it and they it kind of throws them off a little bit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It and there's other dogs that couldn't care less. They'll just <laughs> eat like my lab. Yeah. No, it's true. It's funny. I was, I was uh, speaking to uh, uh, somebody yesterday who's uh, using our products, making her own mushroom blends. And she is putting together the lion's mane, turkey tail, reishi, and, um, oh, there was one more, and the chaga. And her cats love it. Like she, she, really? I know I was shocked. She's like, yeah, they, they just want, you know, they're trying to, they're trying to open the jar to get into it. And I'm like, really with that? I mean, I, I think of the individual powders, I would think that cordyceps and lion's mane would be the most acceptable of any of the individual mushrooms to dogs yeah. and possibly to cats. Yeah. You know, yeah. they, the cordyceps to me tastes a little bit like toast, you know, yeah, 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 it does. It does a little bit. I would agree. Yeah. And um, yeah. yeah, and as we've as we've talked about, I think in the uh, last month's live, we had ju I believe just released the our new lion's mane for pets, and so we discussed that a little bit. Um, as you know, uh, Dr. Silver, that's my favorite mushroom. I know Reishi is your favorite mushroom, but uh, I'm so excited to start hearing feedback on how cats are taking to the lion's mane. Cause I think that's really going to be a very, um, uh, some, uh, a, a flavor that cats are actually going to like, um, of all of the mushrooms. Um, I think so. And didn't you say you think it has a little bit of a fishy. It does. Of, maybe, yeah. Maybe, maybe that's one reason why, why yeah. I like that. Yeah. I, I think so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, Hopefully we'll we'll start set, getting some good feedback on that. Um, so the, the next question um, <clears throat> is: There a basic guideline of what potencies of mushrooms to use for dogs and cats? Is it based on weight? Is there a range of milligrams per pound or kilograms of weight? Thank you. Well, the ideal way to determine a dosage for a mushroom or for anything really is to is to give differing levels to an animal, to whoever your target species is, a human, whatever, and then observe the results from that. And then you choose the dosage tier that gives you the results that you're looking for. Yes. Um, you know, for instance, with, with CBD, 
you know, we might use one low dose for anxiety and one high dose for pain. Likewise, you know, with mushrooms, um, it's the same thing because we have different mushrooms that have different impacts. Like with the reishi, we might be wanting to use it for its antihistaminic properties. Mm -hmm. We might want to use the lion's mane for its calming properties or for its ability to soothe gastritis, for instance, you know, right. soothe the stomach. So it, it may be that when we dig down and really try and really do this kind of a study, a, a dosing study, we have to be very specific about it. So until that happens, because I think it will over time, but it takes time, it takes money, it takes attention to detail in doing that. I set up a dosing scheme for the mushrooms using what I feel is the common denominator in all mushrooms, which is their beta-glucan content. And, um, mu and Real Mushrooms does such a good job of cultivating these mushrooms, or actually Namex, which cultivates them for real mushrooms, that we're able to have high enough beta-glucan content in each of the different mushrooms. So they're all fairly close. They're all fairly within within a fairly close range, 20, 25%, 35%, maybe 40% tops. So I based the dosing recommendations that you'll find on the labels of the pet products on published studies dosing beta-glucans for conditions. And generally we separate the conditions into kind of wellness, mild conditions, kind of moderate conditions, and then, you know, way serious conditions. And for each of those three types of conditions, we have different levels of dosing with the beta-glucans. Yeah. And it seems to work. It, that's what I was doing in my own practice, um, you know, before I retired from practice to do this kind of work. And I'm, I'm applying those same practical principles to these products. At some point in time, we'll be able to say, oh, yeah, reishi as an antihistamine, you want to use these many milligrams of, of this, you know, oh, reishi for immune enhancement. So, I mean, that would be ideal. And, you know, yeah. someone who's, I guess, perfectionist, as you described me to be, and a bit of a science, a bit of a, you know, a nerd. <laughs> I mean that in a good way, Dr. Silver. It's <laughs> a good quality to have. It's a good quality. It's a formulator. But anyway, so that's, that's a long-winded answer to saying that is my, that is yeah. the guideline that we're currently um, suggesting, that it is based on weight and um, it is based on uh, the, the milligrams of beta glucans that we're, we're doing. So that would be like, and because we, because the, the real mushrooms products are all standardized, we, 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 you know, we, we have third party analysis of everything. We are very comfortable that what is in that bag is what we say is on the label, you know? So, um, you know, so if you're looking at, you know, dosing for just wellness, like every day, like we were talking about, you know, doing it continuously as a lifestyle, then maybe two and a half migs of beta glucan per kilogram of body weight per day. So you know what the weight of your dog is, you got the two and a half migs, you know that the ratio is 25 migs of beta glucan per, you know, per whatever, like the, well, the turkey tail, I can tell you is 30 migs of beta glucan per capsule. You can then figure out how many capsules you're going to need. But we also have made some general guidelines on the labeling and, and give you kind of a range of dosing where we say one capsule for 20 to 40 pounds of body weight. So, you know, if it's a wellness kind of thing, you'd probably use the 40 pounds of body weight. If it's a more serious problem, Problem, then you might want to use the 20 or you might even want to go to use more because we know mushrooms are safe and you might get a better response using a larger amount. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Silver. Yeah. And that's, <clears throat> that's one of the things I love the most about the pet line because it does have the dosing right on the, right on the label. And it can be a little confusing uh, if you don't have that dosing uh, get, getting started out. And just to reiterate, what you said, Dr. Silver, that dosing that you listed on the label is kind of the basic starting dosage um, for yeah. general wellness. And um, I, I, you know, my experience is that that that's a pretty broad. You could you could you could give more than that uh, safely uh, if you're dealing with um, you know a more uh, a more serious condition, uh, et cetera. And, uh, you know, that the, the mushrooms are, are, there's just a wide safety range uh, for them. Like right now, like I give Scruffy, you know, for her weight, based on what it says on the bottle, 
it's one chew. Well, I give her two chews a day, you know, because she loves them. And if I give her one, she just looks at me and she's like, is that it? So I've been giving her two chews. Sometimes I even sneak three in, you know, if she wants one at night. Um, and she's doing great. And she's well, uh, they're very safe to use. And you're only limited really by your budget, I guess. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, what would you recommend for uh, for A? Mm -hmm. So I'll just throw in dog or cat with a very sensitive stomach. Okay. So um, first of all, any animal that has a sensitive stomach always concerns me that they may have a reaction to anything we give them to address that sensitive stomach. Yes. You know? yeah. So um, so so when you introduce things to an animal with a sensitive stomach, you want to start with a very small amount. You want to kind of dip your toe in the waters to see if there's a reaction with that small amount. And it can oftentimes help to use um, other things that could be calming, you know, for the stomach. Things, herbal, like for instance, herbal compounds like marshmallow root, for instance, um, or feed foods that are bland, like sweet potato or very wet cooked rice. Those could be very soothing for a sensitive stomach and could be good vehicles to add a mushroom to it. Historically, and through scientific studies, we know that two of the mushrooms that we supply are known for their ability to deal with gastritis and with GI issues in general, although gastritis is where the studies were, were done. And um, one is called lion's mane, which, we discuss, which we've which we been discussing quite a bit for other purposes as well. And the other is chaga, which is more commonly thought of, you know, as an immune enhancing agent. We talked about using that for parasites. The mushrooms really, in, in many ways, all of them are their own little Swiss army knives, you know, <laughs> with their own little set of, of tools. Each one has kind of a little different set of tools in it. Um, and so um, that's what I would recommend. But I would, you know, but I would say don't rush right in and give a bunch of it, you know, to begin with. And and the mushrooms that we um, that we have are high in fiber, and the, the fiber in mushrooms is very good fiber. It's it's a prebiotic, which means that it feeds our microbiome. Those are the, that's the the large number of microorganisms that are in our bowel that really dictate our health or dictate our disease. And by having a well-balanced microbiome, by giving it the right food to promote the growth of the good bugs, something such as a mushroom, that also can help as well. So as an integrative veterinarian, I don't just do something to treat the stomach. I try to look at the whole animal and try to figure out what is it, you know. Maybe there's something in the food that you're feeding on a regular basis, you know. Maybe there's some stressors in the household that are creating more of a neurogenic type of a sensitive stomach. Um, I know some dogs vomit when they go for car rides, not because they're car sick, but because they're nervous, you know. So, um, you know, you want to look at the big picture and, you um, and um, and from that come up with an answer that is workable, but go slowly. Yeah, great advice. Yeah, that actually, as you were talking, I was thinking about a, a, a veterinarian that I was actually uh, speaking with earlier uh, earlier today, who's just starting using mushrooms in her practice. And uh, her own dog has her, uh, she has a lab that has uh, cancer. Mm. And started on turkey tail, started on a real mushrooms turkey tail. And she can give one capsule, but when she increases to two capsule, her her dog gets diarrhea. So hmm. we've been we've been holding at one, and then I was encouraging her to just you know even just increase by a quarter of a you know don't don't go from one capsule to two capsules. Like open that capsule up, just baby steps. But this dog does totally fine with one capsule, but it's a sixty nine pound dog, um, so sh you know. Uh, it would be great for this dog to be on a higher dosage. So she's committing to just taking it really, really, really slow. Um, I'd be happy to chat with her if you'd like to connect. Me. Oh, I would love that. Yes, that would be fantastic, uh, Dr. Silver. Yeah. I was going to talk to you. I was actually going to talk to you about it tomorrow uh, in yeah. our in our regular meeting, but uh, okay. there you go. <laughs> so uh, the next question: um, My dog was recently diagnosed with Addison's disease. My, what mushrooms do you recommend? It's a not a very good disease to, to have, unfortunately. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, yeah. 
It's a disease in which the adrenal glands, which are major players in our endocrine system and our fight or flight system and so many different in our um, in our stress response, um, the adrenal glands aren't working right. They're not producing enough of the molecules that they need to in order to keep our body regulated. And um, there are some herbal approaches to that, but it's such a serious disease that I really believe that you have to use the um, the pharmaceuticals, which to a large extent are steroid-like drugs because the body isn't needs a certain amount of steroids to function well. Um, but there are things that you can use. Um, I, in terms of a mushroom, I would recommend cordyceps specifically mm -hmm. for Addison's disease because of its benefit to energy production in the body, to the adrenergic receptor, um, and because it contains these nucleosides like adenosine, which have a ver which can have a good eff a beneficial effect on energy production um, in the body. It's a great mushroom. It's very tasty. Um, it has research that also shows it beneficial for cancer and a variety of other problems. But I would also look to add licorice root. Oh, licorice yeah. root is um, and like cordyceps, which is considered to be an adaptogen. Licorice root is also an adaptogen. Adaptogens are substances that help the adrenal glands deal with stress. And they're, they're substances that can be taken on a daily basis. Ashwagandha is another one, if you ever heard of that, or astragalus, or Chinese, or American ginseng. But licorice root has a specific effect on the adrenal glands. And it has a, the specific effect of, um, of, um, inc of increasing the sodium, causing sodium retention, and causing the potassium to um, be excreted from the body. And with Addison's, that's one of the problems we have is too much sodium gets excreted because we don't have the right hormones that govern mineral balance being created by the adrenal glands. It's complicated. So using licorice root in combination with the cordyceps and in combination with the appropriate pharmaceuticals, my hope would be that we could get those pharmaceutical dosages down to as low as possible with the addition of these other supplements. That's the essence of integrated medicine. Yeah, yeah. I, I so I love how you uh, you uh, endorse combining Western medicine and integrative medicine. That's also an approach that I am very much drawn to. Um, I mean, integrative medicine can do wonderful things, but there's so many wonderful tools also uh, in the in the allopathic toolbox as well. And you know, for cases like this, yeah, uh, whatever's going to work uh, to help that pet. I think conventional medicine has gotten kind of a bad rap, right? Mainly because there's been too much dependence on it, and yes. because there there isn't this 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 thinking that maybe you know the published dosage in that textbook might be too high. Yeah. You know, maybe going with a lower dosage may still produce beneficial effects if we combine it with other things that have yeah. comparable benefits but don't have the same downsides that the that the drugs do. So yeah, it's it's I, I can't see practicing any other way. You know, and it's really not like I have some agenda. It's like I want my patients to get better. Exactly. And I every freaking tool out there to do it, you know, yeah. whether it's conventional, whether it's, it's it's herbal, whether it's spiritual, whether it's homeopathy, whatever it might take, you know, my mission is to heal and get those yeah. patients better. Yeah, no, uh, I totally agreed. Whatever's going to help that pet. When I first started out uh, doing canine rehab, well, I started out as, as a, a, a veterinary nurse and I my background was all integrative and I was like, no, no Western medicine, you know, no, um, no remedy. Like I had a big problem with the idea of using Rimadyl until I saw these animals having such a wonderful quality of life when it was added to their, to their protocol, you know, and, um, you know, and then using herbs and, you know, and other, other uh, nutraceuticals to support, you know, the gut and, uh, and everything else. Um, so that really helped to, uh, change my mind. Um, we've got a couple, uh, a couple more questions coming in. Um, any recommendations for yeast issues? We feed raw, have done leaky gut protocol, rotate probiotics, medicated bass, and we're still battling this. Well, and that's from Margot. Yeah. I think, um, my answer about yeast is not that much different than my answer about yeah. mice, actually. Yeah. 
except um, and even in terms of looking at what you are feeding, mm -hmm. because it's not just about feeding raw. Right. Um, and I think raw is fine, but I don't think it's for everybody or always appropriate. You know, um, digestive enzymes, you know, are an important thing to add. Probiotics, fermented vegetables may be better than probiotics. They may provide a wider variety of bugs to help restore the microbiome. Yeah. But um, using mushrooms for their benefit to the immune system, I think can be very good. Using yeah. mushrooms for their benefit to the microbiome as well because of their, their good fiber content also yeah. can be very helpful. Um, but I think looking at the foods that could possibly be causing some reaction as well, because with, with many types of food allergies, in, in Chinese medicine, we say they create dampness. And that dampness could be on the skin where we get the um, demodex type of mites, where that dampness, you know, could be in the bowel where, um, you know, we get an overgrowth of microorganisms, maybe they yeast or otherwise. Dogs don't get candida generally, although there are some that can get it, but it's very rare. They usually have to be immune compromised in order to get candida, which is the yeast that we associate with human problems. But they do get overgrowths of microorganisms in the bowel. And, um, and um, certainly um, by adjusting the microbiome, by looking at the food that they're eating so you're not using foods that the body's going to react to, I recommend the saliva test. It's, a, it's different than the blood tests for food allergies. It's much more accurate. And you can do that yourself. You can access that online from a website. Um, Dr. Gene Dodds is involved with yeah. that particular technology, um, but it's difficult and it's it's frustrating. And um, maybe you're talking about maybe you're not talking about yeast in the gut. I'm sorry. Okay, you're ta you're talking about the yeast in the skin, the malassezia, which is really the same. Again, it is the same. Sorry, it is the same thing as the mites in terms of trying to create a healthy skin through improving immune system and microbiome and looking at the different foods. Using digestive boosters as well, like digestive enzymes, mm -hmm. and like uh, fermented vegetables um, might be also worthwhile looking at or looking at some of these products that are fecal replacements, like Animal Biome is one company that has capsules that are made from freeze-dried feces that has, you know, that would be the same as doing like a fecal transplant. And those could also be very helpful. If you're getting totally frustrated, that might be a way to look, that might be a way to go. And uh, Dr. Silver Margo is asking, any particular mushroom she should try with this yeast issue? What do you think, um, reishi maybe? Um, I would say reishi and chaga would be the two that I would think of. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope that helps, Margo. And if you came on late and didn't hear uh, Dr. Silver answered a question about uh, when he was referring to the mite question, that was, I believe, uh, it might have been our first question, and he gave a very long uh, and uh, complete answer to that. So you might want to listen to the recording. Um, so Sheila is saying mushrooms have been such an amazing health, uh, have such amazing health benefits. Some say I may be taking too much. I take two daily of six different supplements. I take like 10 daily. <laughs> Are you talking about yourself, Sheila? Yeah, it's a, it's a human question, but... Uh, capsules, I but no, I, I take much more than that myself. Oh my gosh, yeah. No, I there's, 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 yeah. You should be taking more. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. joking. It, I, it sounds like it, that sounds like a good program. I hope that you're achieving what you're trying to achieve. And... Um, Margo, you said you did a sensitivity test. That was food sensitivity. Was that the, the NutriScan test um, from Dr. Dodds or was that the, the blood test? Because they, they are different tests and I think you'll find the, the saliva test. She did, she did uh, oh no, she said NutriScan is next. Um, yeah, I think NutriScan, yeah. I, I would do NutriScan first. I think that the blood test is okay. worth it. Okay. Uh, yeah, Sheila, I wouldn't, I honestly, I, I, <laughs> if you saw the amount of mushroom, I'm, I'm, I'm totally mushroom obsessed and I, I don't know how many thousands of milligrams of mushrooms of different types of mushrooms I take a day and I have never had a pro. I mean, I just, I just feel better and better. Um, I, uh, I just, 
Yeah, I just added another, uh, I just added Tremella to my giant okay. protocol of mushrooms. <laughs> I'm so. thinking I take, um, I take six, six capsules of uh, three of cordyceps, three of reishi in the morning, and then I take three grams um, of a combination of um, chaga and lion's mane. So um, maybe I'm not up to you yet, Sheila. But yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I would say if you're feeling good, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about it. And Marga says they did the yukari. I guess that's a that's a type of test. Well, I'm not familiar with that one. I'll have to I'm look not familiar that with up. that one either. Yeah. yeah. I always learn something new. I love it. I love these Q and A's. Yeah. Um, so I hope that helps, uh, Margo. And uh, yeah, we have another question from uh, Heather. Uh, uh, wondering if it's possible uh, mushrooms could help uh, partial facial paralysis in my dog. We don't know what caused it, and she's had it for a few years. Wow. They can get it. We call it idiopathic. They can get it for no reason at all. It could be like a, like a viral infection of the nerve, or it could be trauma to the facial nerve, which is um, fairly you know easy to do in dogs that are that roughhouse and stuff. Um, and acupuncture can be very very effective for that as well. Um, when we're dealing with nerve issues, I would definitely look to lion's mane because yeah. lion's mane is known to have nerve growth factors in it, which yeah. might help. Um, and I would also consider, you know, using um, perhaps something like CBD, which has a lot of benefit for neuropathies and can help with the restoration of, of nerve function, as can lion's mane. Two co the combination of the two, I think, is really quite good. Um, but try ac acupuncture, you know, could, um, is supposed to be very good for that. In humans, they call facial paralysis Bell's palsy. And, um, it's, it's, and acupuncture is known to be very effective for that in humans. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, great. Uh, good to know, Dr. Silver. That's, that's a new one for me. Um, Brian is asking, uh, oh, and Sheila had said that the COVID had destroyed her stomach. Um, and so she's, that's why she's doing the mushrooms and she's obsessed as well. Yay, go <laughs> Sheila. Um, and that's Brian is, <laughs> join, join, the, join the, the mushroom obsessed crew. Um, Brian's asking, what about dosages for puppies? Uh, looking at the uh, five defenders and uh, the puppies only, I'm, I'm assuming he's talking about the puppy, is only 7.5 pounds. Well, um, for the puppies, uh, first of all, I wouldn't worry about toxicity, and, and I don't think you're really going to run into a problem if you're giving too much. Um, and I have to sit down with my calculator or pencil to give you the exact um, dosing of that. But I would say if you're looking, you know, if you're looking at capsules of the five defenders, if they're the, the pet capsules, then I would probably recommend half a capsule um, daily for these puppies at this size. And then as they get larger, I would increase that. If you're using the powder, um, I'd probably go with, oh, an eighth of a teaspoon, quarter teaspoon. I, you really can't give too much, you know, um, but I'd start low, especially because we don't want to, you know, challenge a puppy who might have a sensitive stomach or, or something along those lines. But um, wouldn't worry about the, the, the dosages being too much. I'd worry more about them being too little. Uh, hope that helps, Brian. And Heather's asking, um, uh, oh, it looks like she's done acupuncture. Um, she's asking about a good place to buy CD. And if I can do just a, a shameless shout out to Dr. Silver, who if uh, uh, many of you probably know this, but if you don't, Dr. Silver is like the renowned, uh, really a world renowned veterinarian regarding uh, cannabis and CBD for pets. And he cre he's created his own CBD line. So um uh, what is the name of your website, the Well Pet Dispensary, if they no, wanted to well, find out more? Yeah, thank, thank you. I'm, I'm sure, Well, I love your product. I'm embarrassed and, about doing that, but the well I, pet know, I knew you wouldn't do it. So. Wellpetdispensary.com. I also sell real mushrooms there as well, so you can do one one stop shopping. But, you know, you should talk to your acupuncturist. Hopefully they're trained, you know, they're well trained. And I'm surprised that they didn't think to do that. But, you know, right. maybe they were focused on other things. But talk yeah. to them about it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let's see, do we have any more questions? Uh, we're coming to the, getting close to the end of our hour. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there a mushroom supplement that can help my three-year-old Great Dane with his separation anxiety? Well, I would suggest the lion's mane again. 
um, because of its um, calming ability. Separation anxiety can be a pretty pretty difficult problem to extinguish in a dog. And there's some behavioral modification approaches that, that, that you, because oftentimes there's things that you do before you leave the house that cue the dog that you're leaving and kind of gets them all wound up. And so that, and they, as they wind up with their anxiety, it gets out of control. So there's ways of kind of, you know, ex dampening that wind up period, you know, looking at something like lion's mane, but I, lion's mane, you know, it's a, lifestyle supplement it needs to be given on a daily basis it might help with the um the um behavioral training behavioral modification mm -hmm. we have a soft chew here with reishi and some other herbs that are calming herbs and they could also be helpful i also would like to recommend cbd um, i think cbd can be very good for separation anxiety the our soft chews i've put theanine in there and tryptophan in addition to the lion's mane and the reishi and they have a very good effect on producing serotonin in the body and so serotonin that's the calming neurotransmitter um so and there's other things you can do with separation anxiety but but behave you know there's no magic pill unfortunately for behavior and so i think at three he's not so old that he can't be open to some modification. So I'd look in I'd look in your area to see if you can find a behavioral modification specialist, a veterinarian or something. And there may even be these days with video and everything else, there may even be somebody online that can help you, you know. So you don't you might not you might be limited locally. So that would be my suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good luck good luck to you with that. It's uh uh that's yeah. a big dog, you know, three years of age, you know. Yeah, that's a big dog, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. Or, you know, breaking down doors because he's, you know, because he's, he's anxious. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so do we have uh, any, any other questions here or is that, is that the end of the line? Um, yeah, thank I, you for I, that. Oh, good. This is a, yeah, uh, this is, this is a, a good one. So a five-year-old cat diagnosed with tooth resorption. Uh, what would be recommended to help immunity and resistance to plaque bacteria? So um, I know I sound a bit like a broken record. This is a, you know, a kind of a deep seated problem. I don't think there's a single thing we can do to deal with it. I think that, you know, um, regular dental care is very important as well. And although I hate the fact that with some cases of stomatitis, which may be associated with tooth resorption or may not be, that we actually find that by removing the teeth, it's the only cure we get. And in some cases of stomatitis, that doesn't cure it either. Um, so I would use a, a, a mushroom that has um, potency in the GI tract because the mouth is a part of the GI tract. And so for that reason, I would suggest both lion's mane and chaga together. I think mm -hmm. chaga has, has some really strong um, triterpenes in it that have very potent antimicrobial activity. And beta-glucans and the beta-glucans in the lion's mane are pretty high. There's about 30, 35% beta-glucans in the lion's mane, which are going to help the immune system as well deal yeah. with those plaque bacteria. But these are only one part of what should be a, a larger um, program there. Vitamin D, by the way, vitamin D sufficiency has been, insufficiency has been associated with um, feline um, um, oral, um, resorptive lesions or foram, yeah. as we call them. So um, I would get your cat's vitamin D levels checked and get it and get it started as well. Although we're all five years in, you know, there's a lot of a lot of water under the bridge already. But I definitely think that would be what I would suggest if I were your guy. Yeah, such a such a difficult uh, <clears throat> such a difficult uh, uh, syndrome to to work with. This uh, the stomatitis because, yeah, hard. because their mouth is sore. So yeah. they don't like things put in it, you know, yeah. and they may be very sensitive to new yeah. tastes or new foods. It's very challenging. You know, yeah. sometimes what I would do in practice is I would actually put them on a strong steroid just to get the inflammation down so I could get some good stuff in them. Mm -hmm. And then I taper down the steroid and get them off it while they were, you know, and that would that in some cases that strategy worked. In some yeah. cases, nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, good luck with that. Um, and uh, we're about uh, we're about at the end of uh, uh, the end of our hour here. Heather is just mentioning she's wondering if we've ever heard of uh, 
it's in the yeah, I've, I've heard of oh, black black off. Off. yeah, I've heard black of, powder. Um, black yeah. Off. It's um, in fact, I was one of the first users of it when it first came out. Mm -hmm. I was around a while, yeah. I was disappointed in it. I didn't think it worked, and yeah. I kept asking the company to show me some research because you know ultimately you need to really follow the research when you're using products. So I don't know. There might be something better than that, especially if it's not working. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not working. Um, but I think regular dental care is is very important and maybe more frequent than you'd prefer. And, more, and if the cat's organ systems are okay, then the um, impact of the anesthesia won't be as big. Yeah. As, they've got some pretty good anesthesia uh, protocols these days that are pretty low impact. And also, I, I also have used the plaque off. I didn't see the results I was looking for, although some people swear by it. So who knows? I, I um, swear at it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I just, I kept quiet, but I, I thought about swearing at it. <laughs> anyway, um, well, gosh, that hour went by quickly, Dr. Silver. And uh, yeah, this is so much fun. I'm like, I like this. It's fun. Yeah, it's fun. And I, I love, I learn so much uh, every time we do this, uh, Dr. Silver. And uh, it's great engaging with all of you out there. Mm -hmm. So it uh, looks like these are happening. Uh, they've been running about uh, the, the last Thursday of every month. So we'll have to check our schedule and see. Um, you know, uh, and check on that. But um, we'll let you all know when we're doing this again. Uh, they're going to happen monthly. And uh, yeah, we're here for you. Mm -hmm. the Real Mushrooms pet team. <laughs> Thank you for for all of your attendance to the questions and come back next month and try to stump us. You know, that's, yeah. that's fun. <laughs>